Bates with the Futurum Group and welcome to Infrastructure Matter Inside. We are here at KubeCon in Paris, which, which is wonderful. Um, and the booth here we're here with is NetApp. Um, and you might go, NetApp, containers, KubeCon, what the heck are you guys doing here kind of thing. So let me introduce you to our guests here that are joining me. Uh, this is Eric Hahn. He is the VP of the Astra development, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And I've got Shiva Subramanya, who is also the VP of product development for this area. So cool. So before we, first thing I want to jump into is what is Astra? Why did you develop it? What's going on here? Great. Kimberly, thanks for having us, of course. Right. And so Astra simply is that we know that Kubernetes is important. And from a storage and data management point of view, we want to make it simple for customers to consume wherever they are. So public cloud on-prem, Astra's been making it easy for customers to adopt NetApp storage, solve the data management challenges, day zero, day two. And we've been doing that for as long as Kubernetes has been around. So it's 10 years with Kubernetes. Wow, I didn't realize it's been that long. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what Astra has simply done is we've built from our storage provisioning up to data management. We have a lot of exciting things here that we're showcasing today at KubeCon. Yes. Yeah, and I'm really excited to get into those details because I've pre-briefed on all of that. It was, it was really, really cool stuff that you're going into. So one of the things I, I want to tell the people that are listening in here is that you know, I've covered storage for too long, way too many wrinkles in my face. And one of the things I've always looked at is where whatever new is coming up, how is that screwing up how we manage, store, and protect data? And so this, this, that's why this is so important, is because just like we went through the VMware world and it was a crisis for many years, we're doing the same kind of thing here where it's a little bit, it's difficult to manage the data, protect the data, et cetera, and it needs some special technology and integration with it. So maybe I start and I, I turn to Shiva about sure. some of the technical innovations, but you're absolutely right, right? Like VMware, it started off with tests, and then at some point people realized I'm putting persistent workloads or, yes. and so from that perspective, you had backups, you had ability to do patching and distribution and cloning. And that story reappears. Now, one thing I think is if you look six, seven years ago, when Kubernetes was still probably earlier on, you saw it was a DevOps versus IT, but now you see both groups show up together. And from us and the tooling perspective, we need to be able to satisfy both. So the idea here is NetApp always has a strong connection with the IT storage industry. How do we make it so that our customers can quickly deploy and have that observability, that visibility. That's where Spot, Astra, all these technologies, Cloud Insights come together. And when you look at it from a stateful workload perspective, we want to be able to say from a DevOps perspective, how do you consume efficiently in NetApp? How do you have that visibility, that default built-in data protection? And that's where, because of the innovations and the evolution, we're very lucky to have Shiva. Maybe Shiva, you could talk a little bit about Astra's architectural evolution and things we've done. Is that... that would be great. Also, yeah. okay, this is also something very interesting. Yeah. Sheev is coming at us from a database Oracle background. <laughs> and I'm like going, okay, so Sheev I hadn't met before. And so tell us why Oracle database is so important to what you guys are doing with this Astra. Yeah. Thanks for having us, again, Bali. So, uh, I started my career as a database engineer. Um, while I was working on databases, I deployed in different infrastructures, VMware uh, and other bare metals. When Kubernetes came in and we wanted to get our databases on the Kubernetes, that's when I had to go through this learning curve of how to deploy databases on Kubernetes. Okay, so you yeah. felt the pain. I felt the pain, <laughs> right? And uh, Kubernetes was born out of a state, stateless applications. Right. And we were the first, of, one of the first few to deploy databases on Kubernetes. Is that Salesforce? That was Salesforce. So okay. I led a platform engineering team, which actually did stateful application migrations. So that's how my transition from a database into Kubernetes world and into platform engineering. Okay, so tell me about the innovation we're doing here. Yeah, so Eric talked about the why we do uh, Astra. I'll just talk about the how we did it, right? So the main three focus points for us when we Eric and I started brainstorming was um, when we take the goodies of NetApp data management from traditional IT into Kubernetes, we wanted to present that in a much more consumable manner to the Kubernetes audience, Kubernetes So we focused on three main things, Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, security and uh, resilience, and making sure all the personas are being served while we are doing this. So I'll talk about each one of them really quickly. Okay. 
uh, the ecosystem, when we wanted to get into this, uh, we wanted to present the data management into a much more cloud native manner, uh, Kubernetes native manner. So we used a lot of the concepts of CRDs. Uh, we integrated deeply into the ecosystem of our bags. So we wanted to provide customers who are migrating into Kubernetes, use the um, all the nuances that comes with Kubernetes, not long learning curve, mm -hmm. at the same time use Kubernetes are much more efficiently. So we wanted to build that experience for our customers while coming into Kubernetes and use our Net NetApps data management software uh, in Kubernetes. The second point was um, we wanted to build security and resiliency from ground up, yeah. right? So we built a lot of least security privilege, a least privilege. Um, we built in our backs, which are deeply tied into, kind of deeply tied into uh, the Kubernetes software into our CRD models, and we also- So that RBAC is tied into the Kubernetes side of the house, not just on the data management side, is what you're saying? Yes, our data okay. management kind of uh, integrates deeply within those uh, Kubernetes ecosystems, yeah. so to provide those uh, secured software for our customers. Um, and the third thing we wanted to make sure is, how do we present to a developer community, DevOps personas? Uh, we wanted to be semi-opinionated, we wanted to play on our strengths, which is storage management and data management, but let the customers or let the developers choose what toolings they would want to use. So we want to build our experts experts within the sec, uh, storage, but at the same time provide the customers an ability to choose the uh, toolings that they would like to want. So we built this model of architecture, which we termed it Architecture 3.0. It's the third version of the architecture um, uh, to just serve these use cases. So I, when I went through the architecture piece yesterday on, on what was going on, I was really struck with what you guys have done and taken it and, and put it right into Kubernetes, correct? Whereas a CSI is a very different kind of approach to possibly, but you've still kind of advanced what you're doing above and beyond what the traditional, what the CSIs are doing to a higher level capability, almost to the point that you're almost like, you know, we have these things called container native storage offerings that are out there, but this looks like, is designed like it's almost completely container native storage device right smack into the overall Kubernetes space. Am I reading it correctly? Did I, yeah, I, I think that's, that's well said. I think if you look at CSI, CSI is great. It gives people the ability to provision, consume storage, but especially, let's, look, let's talk about once you get into data. Data in Kubernetes itself, you want to be Kubernetes native. And that's what we're talking about with this evolution. And that Kubernetes native really means, custom resources just means I can extend. And if I extend it in the Kubernetes control plane, it makes the IAM, the RBAC, the security native. So now a Kubernetes administrator can come in with Kube Cuddle, the command line. They can come in with the API from Kubernetes API. But server. they already know and know well, and they don't want to go anyplace else. That's right. And then because now we're talking about data of the application, we have the pod, the pod specs, the metadata, the secrets, but we've tied that together and made it native, secure, and we tie it to the storage. Storage being CSI means that it's external. And that external part is always going to be the case because yeah. the life cycle is different. But once you talk about data, you want to be inside the Kubernetes control plane. And that lifting upwards is what's unique. It's different than what the industry's done in the past. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's going to have to think about how do they adapt in this because now every workload is going to run on Kubernetes. So you used a phrase called custom resource definition. Um, I want to translate that for the guys that don't know Kubernetes that are the IT op people. And what I see that as is a deep integration within the Kubernetes space. That's right. And you know, so, so the guys that are listening into this, CRD, custom resource definition, is something that you see that the guys here and at Kubernetes talk about all the time about how do you take whatever open source product or whatever the latest thing is and bring it in there. So you have that capability of using the tools that you know best, whether it's Terraform or those kind of things, as opposed to going outside to external tools to utilize the data. And that's kind of a pretty slick way to integrate it. I think so. CRDs are historic, they're, they're very powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like an extension mechanism. It's saying that if Kubernetes understands containers and pods, what happens if I want to introduce a new noun? Right. And in this new noun we're introducing is around data management, or nouns around data management. But CRDs are also the way people add custom behavior. Uh, it could be for things like AI, right? So the idea really is custom resources are extended. They use the Kubernetes API 
tooling, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but you could define something specific to your use case. And here we're talking about data management, and that makes us much more adaptable to storage administrators' needs, but it also makes us integrated to the workflow of Kubernetes because we're making it specific. So another piece of this is that this is, I don't care where you're at. I can be on-prem, I can be in Azure, I can be in AWS, I can be in GC, GCN, right? and you've got that data management because of your first party relationship as well with all three of those cloud providers and your operating system. So that is, that's really slick. I mean, when I'm thinking about that, because I may you know, spin up a Kubernetes yep. environment, EKS up in AWS, I may want to spin it up over there. And now I have my data wherever I need my Kubernetes or vice versa or however I want to work that. And I, I think this is where, and I'll, Steve, I know I'll, I'll turn to you in a sec. I think this is where- That's where he's smiling big <laughs> time. I really no, like no, this. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm stealing all my favorite questions. This, <laughs> this is where Kubernetes itself lends very well to NetApp strategy, right? Because NetApp is multi-cloud hybrid and we're very strong on-prem. We're very strong in the hyperscalers. We invested a long time ago. And so what's been, one of the things that are interesting is containers and Kubernetes make it portable. But at the same time, you want the best storage possible. So enterprises are saying, I, there's credit card processing companies that are saying, I don't use NetApp on-prem, but I'm gonna go to this hyperscaler, Google Cloud. How can I get your kind of storage, even if I didn't use it before, but how do I get it where I'm going in cloud? And because of your nature of being first party, how do I consume it? And they standardize on Kubernetes because they've done acquisitions, they want to have a platform to commonly integrate with, yeah. and it gives them the ability to centralize, in this case, and move to public cloud. There they need the best storage, and because we are investing and innovating in public cloud with first party, but also with Astra and Kubernetes, it makes it a very simple choice for them. So no, one of the things yeah. is the data services that you guys bring to the table. So ONTAP is very rich with all its data services. Um, in particular, what I understand that you're doing for protection or for data, data management, yeah. metadata, and the data, and what you're doing that has to do with regulations. You want to talk about that and how you're complying to like GDPR and locality, et cetera. Yeah, so the way we approach the like customers who are coming with security requirements and wanted to make sure they want to have a region specific data privacy laws. We wanted to provide them a consistent experience for those customers who are moving between cloud providers, they're moving between on-prem and they're moving between the clouds. So the way we wanted to approach that is much more bottoms up approach, providing them the data primitives and the primitives are the same across the cloud providers. The tunings could change. Right, so we wanted to provide that experience so they can transition their security practices and uh, don't do a lot of tech debt between the cloud providers. So that's the way we approach from a bottoms up approach. Uh, Eric can fill in like from a compliance standpoint how he was looking. Well, because we're in Europe right now, we're in Paris, right? Yeah. Uh, just a week ago, they passed an EU regulation act. And so what we're seeing is containers, whether it's AI, the EU regulation act is around AI, it's really that people want to be able to control where their data is. Yep. So especially because you're asking us and we're talking about cloud as well, in the cloud we want to be able to be specific to that region. Also for us, this uh, approach with custom resources, we can do things like self-contained backups. And that self-contained allows us to make sure that all the data, all the metadata is local. And whether that's on-prem or whether it's in cloud, we're creating the abilities to make sure that AI running in Kubernetes, Kubernetes itself, the data, we can keep it local to where that region, that policy is. So those are examples where these things are coming together. Wow. So what's next? I think we touched on all the major pieces here. What's next for where, where you're going with Astro? What, what could we expect so, to see? I think we're just at the start, right? Like I know that there's been a lot that we've done together. I think from a customer point of view, they're using us in financial services. We're starting to see AI on top. So there will be some innovations in terms of how we satisfy labeling workflows for training. On top of that, I think for us, evolving it so that the hyperscaler consumption is very native and seamless. We had uh, with AWS, with our FSX groups, uh, announcements last year at reInvent where Astra is available for FSX on tap. You'll see more and more of that into the other hyperscalers as well, those kinds of integrations. And then also increasingly the data management, we want to make sure that these workflows are simple, easy to consume. And that means that this custom resources is just at the beginning. 
So we'll be even more able to do a lot of these integrations. More you want to add? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, hit the right point. So what we wanted to do more and more is we wanted to be working with the ecosystem more and more with the Kubernetes ecosystem and customers who are migrating their applications into cloud and into on-prem using the Kubernetes as the ecosystem, we would like to provide a consistent experiences for them, right? So what we are trying to achieve from a bottoms up approach is focusing on global and local security. So when, when customers move part of the application that their security is carried over across the regions. And also we wanted to provide an experience of the data management in CRD model that we adopted is to ensure that they can use those primitives much more efficiently across the scene. So. I mean, I, I love the st strategy here because there's a couple of things. One, meet, meet the developers, the Kubernetes peoples where they're at, which is enabling them to use their tools. Meet the IT operations people where they're at as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we do see a lot of these IT guys going through right now is, am I standing up a separate cluster or am I going to put it on top of my VM world? Who's going to manage these pieces? And they're already stretched really thin. So this gives that efficiency across multiple levels of organizations. You already know this, and this is why you developed it and everything else. But, you know, for somebody listening in, it's kind of like, this, this is really... This is really very innovative, and I, you guys should be very, very proud of what you've been bringing out to the market. Thank you. So, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you very much thank for joining so much. me, and thank you very much for listening in.